Welcome to the webinar, What the Bible Says About Prophecy with Ray Duhon. We encourage you to download the supplemental study guides, charts, and articles to help enhance your study of tonight's subject by going to the articles page on rayduhon.com. Without further ado, here's Ray. Tonight, we are going to look at an event that has two perspectives, the horror and the bliss. We will also present both perspectives side by side in hopes that there will be some that will choose the bliss over the horror. It is the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah. Like our New Year's Eve celebrations, there is tremendous festivity. The two shofar being blown starting at the beginning of the Jewish day, which starts at sunset, since this is, after all, the Feast of Trumpets. All evening long, people have been celebrating the Jewish New Year with the blowing of the shofar trumpets. Suddenly at midnight, without warning, the seventh angel sounded. This regal trumpet blast is heard around the world through announcing the coming of the King of Kings. People look up the spot where this trumpet blast sounded. They see Jesus is standing in the clouds as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The archangel stands before Jesus as the herald of this majestic king proudly proclaiming in a loud voice, along with many other loud voices in the heaven, announcing for all the world to hear, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Suddenly, the angels appear everywhere, dive bombing among people all around the world as this greatest and most catastrophic angelic attack begins on the earth. First, the graves start popping open. The dead bodies zoom through the air to rejoin their living spirits in the air with Christ that are now changing instantly, perfect and immortal. Then all Christians everywhere are suddenly transformed too as they start flying through the air to Christ, snatched by these same angels. This happens so quickly that there is no time for reaction for anyone anywhere on earth. Some people think that the rapture will be secret. However, that is not the case. Every eye will see them snatched from the earth, just as every eye will see the king of kings standing in the clouds next to the archangel calling his bride home. It just happens so quickly that there is no reaction time for anyone to prevent them from leaving as if they could. This powerful announcement fills those who are flying away with great joy. However, it has the opposite reaction on those who are left behind. This proclamation from Revelation eleven fifteen infuriates the nations of the world because they are now doomed. They are now told they are no longer in control of their own lives, and they are now slaves and must bow down to their hated enemy. They attacked, belittled and try to sweep away as a myth for the past 2,000 years. The most catastrophic angelic attack on the earth has just happened as the angels snatch all members of the church, both bad and good, people who have been named Christians. The church has been raptured, and the non-Christians have been left behind. First thing we want to see is Jesus is laying this claim to the kingdoms of the world. The transition between the last message and this message is written in verse 14 of the 11th chapter. The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe is coming quickly. Not only do the angels attack the earth by snatching all the Christians, both good and bad, but this trumpet blast will also announce the outpouring of the seven bowls of God's wrath on those who are left behind. The telescopic judgments of God are now in view as we progress through the final days of the tribulation. First thing we see is that the announcement is given. In verse 15, it says, Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven, saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, 
and he will reign forever and ever, Revelation eleven fifteen. In verse 15, the seventh trumpet sounds and loud voices in heaven announce that the kingdom of the world has become Jesus's kingdom. The praises of the Lord are sounded. He is worshiped for his titles. He is worshiped for his triumphs. As the theme of this hymn goes forward, it's like a crescendo to the entire process of judgment that we have already witnessed. We just saw in chapter 10, the angel of Jehovah come and place his right foot on the sea and his left on the land. And he cried out with a loud voice as when a lion roars. And when he had cried out, the seven peals of thunder uttered their voices. There is nothing as terrifying as the roar of a lion. We can only imagine what God was roaring as he laid claim to the earth and sea once again. Doing it personally sets it firmly in everyone's mind who is in control. More awesome than the loud voices of the archangel and the other voices in heaven proclaiming, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever, who are but echoing God's claim of the earth and all that is in it through the angel of Jehovah. No one could dispute the awesome majesty of the God who roars. Echoing this, this declaration with such power and majesty that the herald of God and all of heaven announced the conquest of the earth is over before it has even begun, knowing that resistance is futile. This glorious and all-powerful God will put an end to sin, make things right, and rule with an iron scepter over the remaining inhabitants of the earth who survived the tribulation. By the side of this king of kings stands his bride, the church whom they murdered and tormented for years. The church will rule with him for a thousand years over the entire earth and oversee all the main controlling areas of society. Those main areas of control over all of society are these. First, administration, leaders of industry, finance, and all levels of government. Secondly, the legal system, including judges of all levels from arbitrators to Supreme Court. Third, education, including teachers of all levels from K to 12, college and universities. And finally, priests, for the purpose of being mediators and reconcilers of people to God. These assignments have been given to the individual righteous Christians who are rewarded according to their deeds at the Bema Seat Judgment. They will be in charge of everything bringing glory back to God. The renowned composer George Frederick Handel chose the passage of Revelation 11:15 as part of the text of his famous Hallelujah Chorus. This is the official proclamation of the coronation of the King of Kings, and he will reign forever and ever. These verses are a preview of what is to come, and not what is actually happening at this moment. The Lord is not officially crowned Lord of Lords and King of Kings until he has defeated all his enemies at the Battle of Armageddon. This does not happen until 40 days later from this date on the prophetic timeline. Right now, the kingdom of this world is under the authority of Satan. In chapter 10, the God who roars has reclaimed it. Now, God has the ultimate authority and sovereignty over the world, but he is yet to take day-to-day -day control back from Satan because God is not through using Satan against himself yet. Revelation is about the conclusion of the gradual taking back of this world by the King of Kings, which started at the cross. In the 15th verse, we are given reason to believe that the coronation of the king is not far in the distance as he takes possession of the world. Approximately 85 days from when the seventh trumpet judgment sounded, if God follows through with the pattern of literal fulfillment of prophecy on the Jewish feast days that he already established, it is here that we look to the opening day of the millennial kingdom when the world will celebrate the coronation of the king of kings. 
Yet there is much to do and so little time to accomplish the remaining prophecies, the chief of which for us is the rapture of the church and for the Jews being regrafted back into the kingdom of God on the day of atonement, which is 10 days from this day of Rosh Hashanah, the day of the rapture. The second thing we see is the response from heaven. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give you thanks, Lord God, the Almighty, the one who is and who was, and because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign, Revelation 11, 16 and 17. The question is asked more than once in the book of Revelation. How long, Lord, until you come and take the kingdom? In chapter 6, the souls of those who were slain called out, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Verse 10. In verses 16 and 17 of chapter 11, the elders help us to understand that the time, according to the prophecy, has finally come. They leave their own thrones and fall on their faces in worship and give thanks because they see the king beginning to reign. It should be no wonder that the 24 elders fall to their faces in worship and give thanks because now Christ has returned to heaven with his bride and has begun to reign. It is an event that Jesus chooses not to do by himself, but with his bride at his side. Charles Spurgeon wrote in his daily devotional, Morning and Even, he says this, It is delightful to reflect how close is Christ's union with his people. We are actually one with him. We are members of his body, and his exaltation is our exaltation. He will give us to sit upon his throne, even as he has overcome and is set down with his father on his throne. He has a crown. And he gives us crowns too. He has a throne, but he is not content with having a throne to himself. On his right hand, there must be his queen arrayed in the gold of Ophir. He cannot be glorified without his bride. So the second thing we see, or the third thing, is the response on earth. And the nations were enraged, Revelation 18, 11, verse 18. Wow, you would think that at this moment, people would be filled with horror at being left behind like Tim LaHaye presented in his Left Behind series, but that is not happening. Remember, over half of the population of the earth has been killed by all the previous catastrophic events, and now people are past being horrified and are now so filled with rage that they are ready to do battle. They can no longer vent their rage on Christ's bride, the church, because she's gone. Now all they can do is vent the rage toward this God. This is a fulfillment of Psalm 2. The psalmist writes this. He says, why do the nations plan rebellion? Why do people make their useless plots? Then he describes the kings and rulers conspiring against God in verse 2. He says, their kings revolt, their rulers plot together against the Lord and against the king he chose. Let us free ourselves from the rule, they say. Let us free ourselves from off their control. But God laughs at them in verse 4. From his throne in heaven, the Lord laughs and mocks their feeble plans. Then he warns them in anger and terrifies them with his fury. On Zion, my sacred hill, he says, I have installed my king. I will announce, says the king, what the Lord has declared. He said to me, you are my son, and today you are my father. And finally, God tells his son, ask, and I will give you all the nations. The whole earth will be yours. You will break them with an iron rod, and you will shatter them in pieces like a clay pot. Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. Now, the rapture of the church is the big thing that we're looking at here tonight. I find it amazing 
that every single one of these rapture experts are quick to dismiss any and every theory of the rapture that does not fit their own. I've seen every single one of them dismiss what the Bible clearly states without an ounce of scripture to back up their dismissals of the clear passages and trumpet their own errant theories while making them sound so profound and great, which leaves us to question, so what actually is the truth? With all this bantering and positioning of theories, why can't we find out what really is the truth? Now, remember, Satan wants us all confused, so he will offer dozens of countering theories so that we will never know what the truth really is. If we don't know the truth, we will only find amongst ourselves and stay confused. One thing I found consistent with each of these so-called experts on what the Bible says they never use all the scriptures. They violate the rules of proper interpretation to spotlight their false doctrine. They pick and choose what proof text they want that fits their pet theory and twist their meanings to say what they wanted to say instead of what it originally said and ignore the rest of the scripture. And when they do that, they will never get it right. So which theory is correct? Well, my answer to that question is another question. What does the Bible say? Here is why the rules of proper interpretation are so critically important. If you want to get the right answer, you have to stick to the rules of proper interpretation that are used on every single scrap of documentation ever written throughout all of mankind's history to get the right understanding that the author of that documentation intended. The same is true of scripture as well. You can write that in stone for those rules will never change. At first glance of the text, we would not see the snatching of the church out of the earth from this passage if it were not for some clear verses that describe the rapture events. In fact, I'm sure you many of people are saying, Ray, how did you reach that conclusion that this is where the rapture takes place? Well, I'm glad you asked. By using several rules of proper interpretation, we come to the answer. Rule number one says, let the author explain himself. Rule number three says, all scripture must be understood in the light of all other scriptures. Rule number nine says, ask the who, what, when, where, why, and how questions of a great sleuth to dig out the answers. And rule number 10, think like a Jew. So let's answer this question from three different authorities in the scriptures. We will soon discover that all three authorities not only agree, but enhance our understanding by providing various facets of that same diamond of truth. So let's look at the first one, the testimony of Paul. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13 and 7 through 17, Paul describes the rapture or the snatching of the way, or in his words, caught up of the bride of Christ in a passage so familiar, every Christian can almost quote it. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, so also God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will re who remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Several things we must note in this passage. The souls of the departed saints are already with God, whom Jesus will bring back with him. Look at verse 14. At his, uh, he says, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. Okay. At his return in verse 15. Those dead in Christ are reunited with their resurrected bodies, and then we 
who will be uh, are alive will be caught up or snatched or raptured with him. By the way, as a side note, the word rapture is never used anywhere in the scriptures to refer to, refer to this event of Jesus bringing his bride home. Question, how are we caught up? Or better yet, who catches us up? We will find the answer to these questions from Jesus' own lips himself, which we will see in a moment. However, Paul isn't through yet. He has more to say about this event. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 58, Paul goes on to describe what happens when we are, as he says, caught up together with them. Notice we become immortal instantly, verses 51 through 52. This takes place at the last trumpet, verse 52, which zeroes in on the seventh trumpet judgment since there are no other series of trumpets blown anywhere in the Jewish culture. Even the Jewish feast day of Rosh Hashanah has but two shofar trumpets, which is also the day of the final trumpet of God is sounded, if God follows the pattern he established of fulfilling prophecy, literally on the Jewish feast days. So let's examine what Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality. But when this perishable puts on the imperishable and this mortal puts on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be firm immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. So what have we learned from Paul? First thing we've learned is that the dead bodies of the saints are resurrected to be reunited by their living spirits that Jesus brings back with him when he calls his bride home. They are immortal at that point. Second thing we learn is that we who are then still alive are snatched up by whom he does not say, and we are made immortal immediately too. Third, it happens at the last trumpet. There is a shout. It doesn't say how many people are shouting. He just says there is a shout. We assume that it is the archangel that does the shouting, and that may be true, but it also does not say that there aren't other people shouting too. The archangel will be announcing with the shout. And number six, we will meet Jesus in the air. Now, let's look at the next authority on the rapture, the testimony of Jesus. Now, Jesus adds some more dimension to this event in Matthew chapter 24, verse 31, uh, verses 29 through 31, where he says, but immediately after the tribulation, I want you to catch that. You can't get any more plain and clear than that. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of heavens will be shaken. Now, as we've already seen, these events, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars fall from the sky, are events that took place at the sixth seal when it was broken. So we see that that was where the end of the tribulation took place and the great tribulation began. That's what took place. So it's what started the, the second half of the tribulation. Now, notice that next little word, then. Then has always been a very powerful word because it always shows a sequence in order. 
And then after the tribulation, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then again, there it is. All the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with the power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet blast and they will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. This shows that the tribulation is practically over, verse 29, and the second coming events start to take place with the rapture, verses 30 and through and 31. Now, here not only does he mention the trumpet call, but also here he sends his angels to gather the church, which is his elect from the four corners of the earth. Now, how do we know that the elect is referring to the church? In Matthew chapter 24, 20, verses 22, 24, and 31, in Mark 13, verse 20, 22, and 27, and Luke 18, verse 7, Jesus talks about the elect. Every one of those verses consistently talking about the elect. And Paul clarifies it as being the church in Romans 8, verse 33. Note, 16 times throughout the New Testament, the term elect is used, and each time it refers to the church. Again, Jesus refers to the church when he talks about cutting the tribulation short. For it, it is for the sake of the elect that Jesus will end the tribulation suddenly so that life will be spared on the earth. Look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 22 through 24. It says this, and if in those days had not been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of, there it is, the elect, those days will be cut short. Again, Jesus says it is the elect speaking of the church that will be tempted by Satan's forces and desert the ranks of Christianity. Look at the next two verses. It, then if anyone says to you, behold, here is the Christ or, or he's over here, do not believe him for false Christ or antichrist and false prophets will arise and will provide great signs and wonders so as to mislead who? The elect. He's not worried about misleading everybody else. He's already got them. So who is he interested in misleading? The church. Okay? So what have we learned from Jesus in this case? We've learned that the rapture is after the tribulation, verses 29 through 30. We also learn that the angels will snatch us up from the four corners of the earth to the sky, verse 31. We also learn that there will be a great trumpet blast, which takes place after the tribulation, verses 29, 30, and 31. Jesus will also appear in the clouds, verse 30. All of the earth will mourn, verse 30. The tribulation will be cut short for the sake of the church, verse 22. False Christ or Antichrist and false prophets are the Mr. 666, which we're going to discover in the next chapter, will try to mislead the church, verses 23 through 24. Wow! It is amazing how people miss this passage of scripture when they try to create a theory when the rapture takes place. The rapture is clearly taught by Jesus himself. Do they not care about Jesus' opinion? After all, is this not his plan that he created? You would think that the one who designed this plan would know what he's talking about. Well, these experts seem to think otherwise. Now let's take a look at what the writer of the book of Revelation has to say about it. The testimony of John. In Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, he says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about the sound, then the mystery of God is finished, 
as he announced to his servants and the prophets. Now, John says that the mystery of God is finished at the last trumpet. Paul repeatedly calls the church the mystery of God. For example, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22 and following, when he refers to the bridal relationship of the church with Christ as that same kind of relationship between a man and his wife. This mystery was only a mystery to the Jews in the Old Testament who could not see between the mountain peaks of Christ's first and second comings. Remember, the book of Revelation is the fulfillment of their final heptad of prophecy given by Daniel in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Since it was written to the Jews, it must be understood from the Jewish point of view to be accurate. Trying to understand it from a 21st century American point of view will always throw us off, so we miss the target every time. Then the seventh angel sounded, and there were loud voices in heaven saying, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and it will reign forever, verse 15. And the nations were enraged, and your wrath came, and the time came for the dead to be judged, and the time to reward your bondservants, the prophets and the saints, and those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth, Revelation 11, verse 18. There are some similarities between what John says with Paul and Jesus' comments concerning the seventh trumpet. Who shouted in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16? An archangel? Yes, maybe more if we add Revelation 11, 15. When is the judgment? It is a point unto man once to die, and then the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27 says. What happens at the judgment? Well, according to Revelation eleven eighteen, 18, the righteous are rewarded and the wicked are destroyed. So what have we learned from John? First of all, we've learned that the mystery of God, the church, is finished at the seventh trumpet judgment. Secondly, we've learned that the seventh trumpet judgment is the final trumpet in the series of trumpets being blown. Third, many voices shouted. The nations were enraged, and the dead are judged, righteous rewarded, wicked destroyed. Those are the things we've learned from John. So when we take these three approaches, and you take these three testimonies of Paul, Jesus, and John, and put them together, this is what we come up with. Here is what we learn from Paul, Jesus, and John, the three foremost authoritative testimonies on the rapture, two of which are apostles, and the third being Jesus, the one who will make the rapture happen. First of all, we've learned that the rapture takes place at the seventh trumpet, which is after the tribulation period. Second, Jesus appears in the sky with the blast of the seventh trumpet. And then the archangel is there, along with many loud voices from heaven, shouting, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. Quickly, we see the dead in Christ are raised to join their living spirits in the air. The angels snatch all of the Christians off the earth, both good and bad. The Bema Seed judgment follows the rapture immediately where the righteous Christians are rewarded and the wicked Christians are sent to the abode of the unrighteous dead to wait the great white throne judgment. So do we listen to Paul and John or to these so-called experts who violate the rules of proper interpretation and refuse to take all the scriptures into account as well as apply their own up uh, in definitions to, uh, to make up terms so that they can push their own opinions. Is it not confusing? No. Jesus was extremely clear. So the real question is, will you be taken home in the rapture, or will you be left behind to face the consequences of your own sins? That's the real question. The confident expectation of things made right at the Bema Seed Judgment, this is where things start to take place here, according to Revelation 11, verse 18. He says, the time came for the dead to be judged, 
the time to reward your bond servants and to destroy those who destroyed the earth. That's the main parts of this. There is a principle of Bible prophecy wherein two events are sometimes put together in the same verse and look uh, like they happen one after the other. But in reality, there's a gap of, the, uh, of time that takes place. It's like traveling in the mountainous area. These appear to be one uh, mountain peak, but when you get closer, you see there are valleys between the peaks and actually two or three peaks. This is actually rule number eight, beware of the mountain view effect. One illustration of this principle is in Isaiah 61 verses one and two. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord anointed me to bring good news to the humble. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. Now, the spoken pro prophet spoke that the Lord had anointed him to various things among them, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, clearly referring to his ministry here on earth 2,000 years ago and the tribulation which is yet to come. In Luke 4, verse 16 through 21, Jesus read to those gathered in the temple from Isaiah 61. He stopped reading in the center of the verse, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He stopped quoting at that point because it wasn't time yet for the vengeance of God. When this verse includes the vengeance of God, of our, uh, the day of vengeance of our God, it spanned all of the time between the first time Jesus came as a baby and the second time when he comes on a white horse to do battle. Another illustration of this mountain view effect is in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 23 and 24, which says, but each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, after that those who are Christ at his coming, and then comes the end, when his hands over the kingdom to our God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power. Paul is giving the order of the resurrections. Christ was resurrected first. Then when Christ comes, those who belong to him will be resurrected. Then the end will come. There are at least 2,000 years between Christ's resurrection and the res resurrections that will happen after he comes. Then another 1,000 years, the millennial reign, until the end. There are great time spaces between each statement. This same principle is at work in Revelation eleven eighteen, When the trumpet sounds and the elders join in worship, the feeling of all redeemed creation is expressed. The final stage of the final events are announced. We will look at the four major events that are mentioned in verse 18. It says right there, the nations are enraged and your wrath came. And the time came for the dead to be judged, the time to reward your bond servants, the prophets and the saints, and to those who fear your name, the small and the great, and to destroy those who destroy the earth. First thing we see is the wrath of God on the living. It says, your wrath came. Earlier in Revelation 11, the nations have trampled all over Israel, including Jerusalem, mocking God and rejoicing at the killing of the two witnesses. Now they are angry at God's impertinence. How dare he claim himself as king of the world? How dare he say, I have to do what he says from now on? They hate God for interfering with their self-imposed wicked lifestyle. They are ready to take on God and remove him from their lives. They are badly mistaken and badly overmatched. With the church raptured, they have no one to war against. At the rapture, people are snatched so quickly in the twinkling of an eye. There can be no response from those who would want to stop it from happening. And as all the left behind movies like to point out, airplanes crash with no pilots, cars crash with no drivers, disasters start to take place all over the place because there is no people controlling buses, trains, etc. But these disasters aren't the worst part of the rapture. Two things happen when Christians are removed from the earth. The first thing that happens, the final opportunity to repent 
has been removed. And the, what we need to do, it has been, re, uh, their final destiny has been sealed to an eternity in the lake of fire, which will be an everlasting torment for these people. This is the greatest woe of the three woes that the eagle warned about. There is no hope because there can be no repentance. God has removed the final opportunity for them to repent because that was the mission of the church. And now she is gone. There won't be any bad Christians to bemoan the fact of being left behind, giving any further warning to even try to repent. They're all gone too. All that remains is a horrifying thought of spending the rest of eternity in a fiery pit called hell. The second thing is the seven bowls of wrath is about to be poured out. This is about to be unleashed upon the earth in a short 30-day span, time span from the remaining survivors of the tribulation to suffer. The only ones exempt from the bowls of wrath that are still on the earth are the 144,000 Jews who are here as God's representatives, as place markers, if you will, to show God's ruling authority on the earth while he is in heaven with his bride at the Bema seat judgment. Look at verse 18 again, the judgment of the dead. Nations are erased and the time came for the dead to be judged. God's wrath against the nation is followed in this list by God's judgment of the dead. The phrase and the time of the dead that they should be judged there in verse 18 takes us to two places. First of all, it takes us to the Bema Seat judgment, and the secondly, the Great White Throne judgment, which is nearly at the, the end of the book of Revelation. First, the Bema Seat judgment. We're going to see here, uh, uh, watch it be unfolded to us and help you see how this thing totally works for us. The beam of seed judgment is going to be explained by this color code below. When you take a look at it, you can see the different colors referring to righteous Christians, wicked Christians, angels, Satan or hell, God, Jesus, and the church. So look at what he says. This judgment is for the Christians. At this, no non-Christians, just Christians. At this judgment seat, the Christian will be judged according to his deeds, what Paul, according to what Paul said there in 2 Corinthians. And he says, uh, according to his deeds to be rewarded according to the positions of authority in Christ's new government in the millennial kingdom, or to be cast into outer darkness for the final judgment. Two parables that Jesus told back to back explain this beam of seat judgment. Both are found in Matthew 13. The first one is the parable of the wheat and the weeds that Jesus explained in verses 37 through 43, which he says, and he said, the one who sows, God or Jesus, the good seed, righteous Christians, is the son of man, Jesus. And the field is the world. And as for the good seed, righteous Christians, these are the sons of the kingdom, righteous Christians, and the weeds, or wicked Christians, are the sons of the evil one, wicked Christians. And the enemy, which is Satan, who sold them is the devil, or Satan. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers, or angels, are angels. So just as the weeds, the wicked Christians, are gathered up and burned with fire in hell, so shall it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man, Jesus, will send forth his angels, and they, his angels, will gather out of his kingdom, the church, all the stumbling blocks, or wicked Christians, and those who commit lawlessness, <clears throat> again, wicked Christians, and they, the angels, will throw them, the wicked Christians, into the furnace of fire, which is hell. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, hell. And then the righteous, which is the righteous Christians, will shine forth like the sun 
in the kingdom of their father or the church. The one who has an ear, let him hear. Matthew 13, 37 through 43. Now we are told that the angels gather up the wheat and the weeds at the same time in verse 30. But here in verse 41, they will remove the wicked Christians called stumbling blocks and lawless out of the kingdom and cast them into hell in verse 42. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom in verse 43. The second parable, the parable of the dragnet, explains it again in verse 47 through 50, only a little bit clearer. Here he says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet. Again, he uses the same color code. Kingdom of heaven is the church. The dragnet is the church that was cast into the sea and gathered fish of every kind or Christians, okay, of every kind. And when it, the church, was filled, they, the angels, pulled it up on the beach, and they, the angels, sat down and gathered the good fish, which is the righteous Christians, into containers. But the bad or wicked Christians, they, the angels, threw away into hell. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth and remove the wicked from among the righteous. And they, the angels, will throw the wicked Christians into the furnace of fire or hell. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Again, hell. You can take that phrase, weeping and gnashing of teeth, when they talk about that place, consistently referring to the same place in every single one of Jesus' parables that he mentions it as being hell every single one. So you can see here the consistency of thought. Notice the fish of every kind, good and bad, are the Christians. The kingdom of heaven is the church. At the end of the world, the angels will remove the wicked Christians and throw them into hell, verse 50, while the righteous Christians are saved. Paul elaborates on the Bema Seed judgment a little bit more in 2 Corinthians 5.10, where he says, for we must all, talking about the church, appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be receive compensation for his deeds done through the body in accordance with what he has done, whether good or bad. The only people both of these parables refer to is to those who are in the kingdom of heaven, the church not the world. It is from out of the kingdom of heaven the angels are gathering these people, not the rest of the world. When do the angels gather the church? The angels gather the elect, wicked and righteous, at the rapture, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, verses 29 through 31. The rest of the world is not dealt with at this point. That will happen at the second resurrection, or better known as the great white throne judgment. This is the one event that is very clearly located on the prophetic calendar. When are the dead outside of Christ, key phrase here is outside of Christ, going to be judged? Revelation chapter 20 verses 11 through 12 says this, Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it from whose presence earth and heaven fled, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 and 12. No one can run away from the judgment of God, Look at verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades, which is the abode of the dead, which everybody is in right now, the, the abode of the wicked dead, gave up the dead who are in them, and they were judged, each one of them according to their deeds. These dead, those who have rejected Christ, come before the great white throne judgment. If their name is not found in the book of life, they will be thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. 
all Christians come before the Bema Seed judgment of Christ to be judged. The wicked Christian will be cast out into the abode of the dead to wait for this great white throne judgment because their name is no longer in the Lamb's book of life. It has been blotted out. They will be judged by all the books and be found guilty and sent to the lake of fire along with the rest of the wicked. The righteous Christian will not appear before the great white throne to be judged. At this point, we will stand acquitted by the blood of the Lamb and our names proudly read from the Lamb's book of life as a testimony against the wicked, who at this point are on the left awaiting their final sentencing. The martyred Christians will get to see God's final vengeance carried out against their killers at this judgment. Only those who come to Christ during the millennial kingdom and the wicked will appear before the great white throne judgment for judgment since the Christian born during the millennial kingdom will not have experienced life before the millennium, nor being before the Bema Seed judgment of Christ. The Christian born during the millennial kingdom will find his reward with the rest of the saints. The wicked who have resurrected specifically for the great white throne judgment will face the guilt of their deeds and the sentence of eternal death in the lake of fire. There are about 1,000 years between these two judgments. The believer's judgment is after the rapture and before the millennial kingdom. The great white throne judgment is after the millennial kingdom. The third thing we're going to look at there is the saint's reward. Now, looking at that verse again, we won't be sitting on clouds strumming harps being blissfully bored to death. God has always had a mission for man to fulfill all the way back to Adam and Eve to manage the earth and all that is in it. Even here in the millennial kingdom, God gives the saints incredible responsibilities. The saints' rewards were given to them at the beam of seed judgment, and the rewards are positions of authority given to them to rule during the millennial kingdom. These are, the in, uh, these are in the areas of, first of all, administration, like we said, leaders of industry, finance, and all levels of government, the legal system, including judges of all levels, from arbitration to the Supreme Court, education, including teachers of all levels, from K-12 through uh, colleges and universities, and finally, priests, for the purpose of being mediators and reconcilers of God, uh, to people, to God. These assignments will be given to the individual righteous Christians who are rewarded according to their deeds at the Bema Seat Judgment. They will be in charge of everything, bringing glory back to God. At that education and all the experience that we've gotten while on earth, just by living here, both good and bad experiences, will have prepared you for being ready to work in those areas of leadership. God never wastes anything, whether it is a hurt, pain, loss, heartaches, joys, education, good or bad experience, everything. Instead, God uses it for our preparation for this time. Jesus illustrates this in the parable of the talents in Matthew 25. To the servants that doubled their talents in service to the master, Jesus says this, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You are faithful in a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter the joy of your master. That's what happens. That's where we get the rewards is during that time. We will be put in charge. Now, the fourth thing that we see in this whole situation is the doom of those destroy who destroy the earth, okay, in verse 11, uh, verse 18, rather. The final judgment is the judgment of those who destroy the earth. Those are the demons. Satan is the great destroyer, and anyone who follows him is a destroyer. Notice in Isaiah that there is a difference between these demon creatures and the inhabitants of the earth in Isaiah 24, verse 21 which says, so it will happen on that day that the Lord will punish the rebellious angels of heaven on high and the kings of the earth, where? On earth. 
According to Isaiah 24, verse 21, there will be an all-out war between the fallen angels teaming up with the forces of the Antichrist, or as it says here in Isaiah, the kings of the earth against Christ with the heavenly host. Where is that going to take place? At the battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21. All this is yet to come. This is a broad brush statement that of what will happen. The entire progress of Revelation is here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. The rest of Revelation fills in the details. So let's take a look at the blessed assurance from the thrones. Here we see the passage of tremendous evidence of God's grace and mercy in the book of Judgment. He pushes the picture of judgment aside and gives a little picture of his love and grace and mercy and protection for us. In the beginning of the 11th chapter, we are given a vision of the temple in verse 1, where he says, Then there was given to me a measuring rod like a staff. And someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. This is talking about the tribulation temple that is yet to be built. At the end of the 11th chapter, we are given a vision of a temple in heaven. The temple in heaven is opened up so that we can look at the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant symbolizes the visible sign of the presence of the divine power of God in our midst. And the temple of God, which is in heaven, was opened, and the ark of his covenant appeared in his temple, and there was flashes of lightning and sounds and peals of thunder, and on the earth, and an earthquake, and a great hailstorm, verse 19. Inside the ark are the tables of the law, which symbolize the encouragement of God's word, the pot of manna, which symbolizes the certainty of God's sufficiency an Aaron's bod, uh, rod that buds, which symbolizes the life of God, Hebrews 9, verse 4. In the midst of the turmoil and destruction, God shows the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant was hidden just before the exile and just recently found in a cave beneath the cross where Jesus died. The sprinkling of blood by our high priest, Jesus, on the mercy seat was a fulfillment of the atonement made for our sins. The vision of the ark in the heavenly sanctuary shows that the things for which it stands can never be destroyed. No war on earth can take away the presence and protection of God's power. This vision is certainly a great encouragement of God's suffering people. No one escapes tribulation, but we are encouraged in the midst of the tribulation by God's word, God's provision for us, God's life. It is the life of God within us that preserves us. There was an earthquake that also keeps coming up in the book of Revelation. Earthquakes are always a sign of God's judgment. God shakes the earth when he wants to get our attention. With earthquakes, people are driven out of their homes and live in tent cities. Businesses are destroyed and people's hearts actually fail because of fear. That's the way it will be. Earthquakes and turmoil and people turning on one another. God gives us this picture of the coming kingdom and reign of God, the vision of the ark, and all this bleak judgment to let us know that in spite of what appears, God is still in heaven. He is still in charge and is still, according to the 24 elders in this passage, the one who is and who was and who is to come because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. Father, we thank you that we can see how you have given us a vision of what is going to happen in the future. No matter how bleak things are right now, we can see how you and your great power and wisdom have it all planned out, and it's all working according to your plan. Father, we pray that we will not lose heart, but keep pursuing you and focusing in on Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.